could only compel her. He seemed to be annihilated. She was cold and hard and compact of brilliance as the moon itself, and beyond him as the moonlight was beyond him, never to be grasped or known. If he could only set a bond round her and compel her. So they danced four or five dances, always together, always his will becoming more tense, his body more subtle, playing upon her, and still he had not got her. She was hard and bright as ever, intact. But he must weave himself round her, enclose her, enclose her in a net of shadow, of darkness, so she would be like a bright creature gleaming in a net of shadows, caught. Then he would have her, he would enjoy her, how he would enjoy her, when she was caught. At last, when the dance was over, she would not sit down, she walked away. He came with his arm round her, keeping her upon the movement of his walking, and she seemed to agree, light, as bright as a steel blade. He seemed to be clasping a blade that hurt him, yet he would clasp her if it killed him. They went towards the stackyard. There he saw, with something like terror, the great new stacks of corn glistening and gleaming, transfigured, silvery and present under the night-blue sky, throwing dark, substantial shadows, but themselves majestic and dimly present. She, like glimmering gossamer, seemed to burn among them, as they rose like cold fires to the silvery bluish air. All was intangible, a burning of cold, glimmering, whitish, steely fires. He was afraid of the great moon conflagration of the cornstacks rising above him. His heart grew smaller, it began to fuse like a bead. He knew he would die. She stood for some moments out in the overwhelming luminosity of the moon. She seemed a beam of gleaming power. She seemed a beam of gleaming power. She was afraid of what she was. Looking at him, at his shadowy, unreal, wavering presence, a sudden lust seized her, to lay hold of him and tear him and make him into nothing. Her hands and wrists felt immeasurably hard and strong, like blades. He waited there beside her like a shadow which she wanted to dissipate, destroy as the moonlight destroys a darkness, annihilate, have done with. She looked at him and her face gleamed bright and inspired. She tempted him. And an obstinacy in him made him put his arm round her and draw her to the shadow. She submitted, let him try what he could do, let him try what he could do. He leaned against the side of the stack, holding her. The stack stung him keenly with a thousand cold, sharp flames. Still obstinately, he held her. And timorously, his hands went over her, over the soft have her, how he would enjoy her. If he could but net her brilliant, cold, salt-burning body in the soft iron of his own hands, net her, capture her, hold her down, how madly he would enjoy her. He strove subtly, but with all his energy, to enclose her to have her, and always she was burning and brilliant and hard as salt, and deadly. Yet obstinately, all his flesh burning and corroding, as if he were invaded by some consuming, scathing poison, still he persisted, thinking at last he might overcome her. Even in his frenzy he sought for her mouth with his mouth, though it was like putting his face into some awful death. She yielded to him, and he pressed himself upon her in extremity his soul groaning over and over, let me come, let me come. She took him in the kiss, hard her kiss seized upon him, hard and fierce and burning corrosive as the moonlight. She seemed to be destroying him, he was reeling, summoning all his strength to keep his kiss upon her, to keep himself in the kiss. But hard and fierce she had fastened upon him, calling all his strength to keep his kiss upon her, to keep himself in the kiss. But hard and fierce she had fastened upon him, cold as the moon and burning as a fierce salt, till gradually his warm, soft iron yielded, yielded, and she was there, fierce, corrosive, seething with his destruction, seething like some cruel, corrosive salt around the last substance of his being, destroying him, destroying him in the kiss, and her soul crystallized with triumph, and his soul was dissolved with agony and annihilation. So she held him there, the victim, consumed, annihilated. She had triumphed, he was not any more. Gradually she began to come to herself. 
Gradually a sort of daytime consciousness came back to her. Suddenly the night was struck back into its old, accustomed, mild reality. Gradually she realised that the night was common and ordinary, that the great blister, the nothingness was Skrebensky. Was he really there? Who was he? He was silent, he was not there. What had happened? Had she been mad? What horrible thing had possessed her? She was filled with overpowering fear of herself, overpowering desire that it should not be, that other burning corrosive self. She was seized with a frenzied desire that what had been should never be remembered, never be thought of, never be for one moment allowed possible. She denied it with all her might. With all her might she turned away from it. She was good, she was loving. Her heart was warm, her blood was dark and warm and soft. She laid her hand caressively on Anton's shoulder. "'Isn't it lovely?' she said, softly, coaxingly, caressingly. And she began to caress him to life again, for he was dead, and she intended that he should never know, never become aware of what had been. She would bring him back from the dead, without leaving him one trace of fact to remember his annihilation by. She exerted all her ordinary warm self. She touched him. She did him homage of loving awareness, and gradually he came back to her, another man. She was soft and winning and caressing. She was his servant, his adoring slave, and she restored the whole shell of him. She restored the whole form and figure of him, but the core was gone. His pride was bolstered up, his blood ran once more in pride, but there was no core to him. As a distinct male he had no core. His triumphant, flaming, overweening heart of the intrinsic male would never beat again. He would be subject now, reciprocal, never the indomitable thing with a core of overweening, unabatable fire. She had abated that fire, she had broken him. But she caress she had abated that fire, she had broken him. But she caressed him, she would not have him remember what had been, she would not remember herself. Kiss me, Anton. Kiss me, she pleaded. He kissed her, but she knew he could not touch her. His arms were round her, but they had not got her. She could feel his mouth upon her, but she was not at all compelled by it. Kiss me, she whispered, in acute distress. Kiss me. And he kissed her as she bade him, but his heart was hollow. She took his kisses outwardly, but her soul was empty and finished. Looking away, she saw the delicate glint of oats dangling from the side of the stack, in the moonlight, something proud and royal, and quite impersonal. She had been proud with them, where they were, she had been also. But in this temporary, warm world of the commonplace, she was a kind, good girl. She reached out yearningly for goodness and affection. She wanted to be kind out yearningly for goodness and affection. She wanted to be kind and good. They went home through the night that was all pale and glowing around, with shadows and glimmerings and presences. Distinctly she saw the flowers in the hedge-bottoms, she saw the thin, raked sheaves flung white upon the thorny hedge. How beautiful, how beautiful it was! She thought with anguish how wildly happy she was tonight, since he had kissed her. But as he walked with his arm round her waist, she turned with a great offering of herself to the night that glistened tremendous a magnificent, godly moon, white and candid as a bridegroom, flowers silvery and transformed, filling up the shadows. He kissed her again under the yew-trees at home, and she left him. She ran from the intrusion of her parents at home to her bedroom, where, looking out on the moonlit country, she stretched up her arms, hard, hard, in bliss, agoned of sorrow. She had hurt herself, as if she had bruised herself in annihilating him. She covered up her two young breasts with her hands, covering them to herself, and covering herself with herself, she crouched in bed, to sleep. In the morning the sun shone, she got up strong and dancing. Skrebensky was still at the marsh, he was coming to church. How lovely, how amazing life was! On the fresh Sunday morning she went out to the garden, among the yellows and the deep vibrating reds of autumn. She smelled the earth and felt the gossamer. The cornfields across the country were pale and unreal. Everywhere was the intense silence of the Sunday morning, filled with unacquainted noises. 
she smelled the body of the earth. It seemed to stir its powerful flank beneath her as she stood. In the bluish air came the powerful exudation. The peace was the peace of strong, exhausted breathing. The reds and yellows and the white gleam of stubble were the quivers and motion of the last subsiding transports and clear bliss of fulfilment. The church bells were ringing when he came. She looked up in keen anticipation at his entry, but he was troubled, and his pride was hurt. He seemed very much clothed. She was conscious of his tailored suit. "'Wasn't it lovely last night?' she whispered to him. "'Yes,' he said, but his face did not open nor become free. The service and the singing in church that morning passed unnoticed by her. She saw the coloured glow of the windows, the forms of the worshippers. Only she glanced at the book of Genesis, which was her favourite book in the Bible. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes in the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But Ursula was not moved by the history this morning. Multiplying and replenishing the earth bored her. Altogether it seemed merely a vulgar and stock-raising sort of business. She was left quite cold by man's stock-breeding lordship over beasts and fishes. And you, be ye fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. In her soul she mocked at this multiplication, every cow becoming two cows, every turnip ten turnips, in me and you, and every living creature that is with you, for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that a bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Destroy all flesh? Why flesh in particular? <laughs> Hello. Hello.